to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. What an awesome God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Yeah, give him a hand. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you all. Amen. Appreciate your praise, your worship. Thank you so much for sharing your testimonies and prayer requests. Amen. Welcome to everybody online and uh, Facebook and however you're joining us today. And I just, uh, in agreement with the church here, we just speak health and wholeness and healing wherever you are, whatever your situation, whatever you're faced with. God is greater. Amen. He is the victory. Amen. And He overcomes everything on behalf of His people. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. What a mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's none like Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So again, welcome all of you that are with us uh, via the internet and wherever you are around the world, Pakistan. Brother Sam, God bless you and yours and uh, all of you, from one end of the nation to the other and, a, and around the world even for that matter. Amen. Who would have thought there would be a day when a small church like this could touch people all around the world. That's the thing. That's, that's the Lord. Amen. Not everything on the internet is good, but God is. Hallelujah. So praise the Lord. Amen. God is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. So uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Praise the Lord. Won't get a chance probably to see most of you again until next Sunday, which will be the day after Christmas, and uh, everybody will be uh, recovering from their family get-togethers and the turkey and the ham and the whatever else may be part of your tradition. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. We're excited about this season of the year, but we need to try to make a way to carry this over. Yes. Amen. Into the new year so that God, amen, is honored and lifted up and recognized in all of our lives every day of every, every year. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to, this is my attempt to uh, do a Christmas message, praise the Lord. You all know I struggle with these Easter Christmas things, praise the Lord, but I'll do my best, hallelujah. I do feel like I have something from the Lord for you, and just, it's just always a little bit different way maybe than the uh, traditional, but praise the Lord. Still God, He's still good, He's still our Savior, amen, and we're celebrating Him in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for being here today and being a part of the service today. And, and I do pray that uh, you and your families have the best of Christmases, leading us into a great new year with the Lord. Amen. Well, God has got some tremendous things planned in the year 2022. Amen. In spite of what man wants to do, God is greater. Amen. Hallelujah. And the bottom line is, sometimes we get our miracle instantaneously and sometimes it's a process. But we get it nevertheless. Amen. It's just, it just requires our faith in God and believing in His Word. And it shall come to pass even as He has spoken. Praise the Lord. So thank the Lord for that. Amen. Let's begin with Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And then I'm going to read a couple of lengthy scriptures because I don't, I'm not going to use a whole lot of scripture today, although I will have scripture, but just not too much because I wanted to move through this as quickly as possible, not to be... Uh, you know, brief or to cut anything short of the Lord, but just uh, so that we can uh, get you out of here at a reasonable time. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Luke chapter 1, and I want to read verses 26 through 28. Luke 1, verse 26 through 28. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth 
to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Uh, I'm sorry, 38, through 38. I thought we were just having an emphasis on this. <laughs> and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. Luke 2, 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. In verse 19 it says, Mary pondered all of this in her heart. And another uh, translation for that is she wondered, she was in awe of all these things and trying to put, I mean, the, the wonder of it, just imagine, was just overwhelming for her. And she was trying to kind of sort everything out and figure out what in the world is happening right now. What is God doing? So there was a wonder to it all, obviously. The Virgin Mary. You know, Mary was Jewish. Uh -uh. Right, right, she was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish, praise the Lord. She was never called Mary. She was named Miriam. 
probably after the Miriam, Moses' sister. And the one, the sister of Moses, the, the Miriam who uh, was given this job, this critical job of watching over her baby brother while he drifted down the Nile River with the crocodiles and with all of the, you know, potential harm and danger and uh, crises it could create. Her mission was to protect his life because Moses was going to grow up to become the deliverer to set his people free. But it was Miriam who ensured that he would survive as a baby in order to do that. Exodus 2, uh, verses 1 through 9. doesn't give us a lot of details, but we know that uh, this was Miriam's task. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to a wife the daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months, because we know there was an edict out to kill all the male children. And when she could not no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it with, in the flags by the river's bank, brink. And his sister stood far off to wit what would happen to him. In other words, she was there to see what was going to take place. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, Miriam, said to the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the women took the child and nursed it. So Miriam's call was to watch over the life of the Redeemer, to bring him into a place where he could bring salvation. And over a thousand years later, another Hebrew child would be given the same name, Miriam, and the same calling, to bring the Deliverer, the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, into a fallen world. His name means salvation. So it's Miriam who ushers in salvation. You know what the name Miriam means in, in uh, Egyptian? Love. So Jesus is born of God's love. In Hebrew, Miriam means something very different. It means bitterness and rebellion. That could put you off there for a moment, right? But actually, that's good. Because God causes Miriam to give birth to Yeshua, to Jesus. And God causes a world of bitterness and rebellion to give birth to salvation. Yeah. When he said, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, he didn't mean that there would be peace on earth. He didn't mean that all of us would be buddies. What he meant was, there would be peace between us and God and goodwill from God towards mankind. Where there had been that separation, there would no longer be that. We had access again to our Heavenly Father. Amen? He causes Jesus to be born in us. The other miracle, he even takes lives of bitterness and rebellion and brings new life to them. Through bitterness and rebellion is born salvation. Even through us. I think about this, and you know, it's, it's one thing for God to bring himself into this world of bitterness and rebellion. But he chose to bring that into me, yeah. filled with bitterness and rebellion, just like Tim was talking about. We look at our lives and we think, how in the world would God even bother to blink at me, at my existence, let alone die for me, to be born, to be brought low, 
into this earth as a human being so that you could save me. So through this bitterness and rebellion, salvation is born, even through us. So in a strange and a weird way, we're all Miriams. We all bring salvation, not only to ourselves, but we're able to birth it to others. And that's really what this season is about. Yes, it's recognizing what God has done for us, but it's also understanding the responsibility we have to others. It's called Christmas. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 16. How many people today, and on the literal day that we celebrate as Christmas, will be in bitterness and rebellion? will be hurting, will be totally confused, totally ignorant of what God has done for them and what he wants to bring to their lives. While we celebrate, and thank God what we do and can, there are many who are just as miserable on Christmas, if not more so, than they are every other day of the year. And how desperately God wants to birth in them a Savior just as he has in us. Praise the Lord. In Matthew chapter 1 through 16, it says the book, this is the generations uh, of Miriam and uh, Joseph. And it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat Pharaohs and Sarah the, uh, of, of Tamar. In other words, Judas' son was Pharaoh's, and Pharaoh's son was Sarah that was born to them through Tamar. Remember Tamar? Not such a great gal. And Pharaoh's begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram. And Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Naasun, and Naasun begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and of Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David, the king. And David, the king, begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Solomon begat Rehoboam. Rehoboam begat Abi. Abi begat Asa. Asa begat Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat begat Joram. And Joram begat Uzziah. Uzziah begat Jotham. And Jotham begat Achaz. And Achaz begat Ezekias. Ezekias begat Manasseh. Manasseh begat Ammon. And Ammon begat Josiah. Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Iliad. Iliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Praise God. See, in Israel, there is a law or a commandment of God that when a woman was left a widow with no children, the law said if a near relative could redeem her house by marrying her and providing for her and giving her children, and he would be called a goel. G-O-E-L, a goel. And the Bible records several instances where that law is fulfilled. We read a couple of them right here in this genealogy. These fulfillments, or another translation is redemptions, are all focused on one specific tribe, Judah, and one specific line within that tribe, David. So the man Judah became the goel of the widow Tamar and fathered her child. And from that child and line was born the man Boaz. Boaz in turn became the Goel of the widow Ruth and fathered her child Obed. And from Obed became Jesse, from Jesse became David, the king. And so King David only existed because of the law of the Goel. His genealogy had two Goels intervene within it. Substitute fathers. 
twice it happened. And it would be this line that would see one more intervention, one more substitute fathering, one more Goel. And it would happen in the same place where Boaz redeemed Ruth, Bethlehem, the house of bread. That's where God himself became the Goel. God intervening in that line. God himself becomes the substitute father, and so the virgin birth. You say, but Mary wasn't a widow. No, the widow was Israel. The widow was humanity. The widow was creation. Creation was barren, cut off from the creator, unable to bear the fruit that it was meant to bear, unable to produce what it was created for. Good Isaiah chapter 54, verses 4 and 5. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. You know, I told this a long time ago. I've told it multiple times. But, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago or close to it now, I was praying. We were in, living in East Texas. God was calling me into the ministry. I didn't know what the world was going on. I was, uh, I mean, an ex-druggie and mm, failed relationships all over the place and all sorts of issues. And uh, I was born again and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and God immediately began to deal with me. And I thought I was losing my mind, to be quite honest with you. I thought it was from drug withdrawals. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I felt like if I could get high up, I'd be all right. I could kind of just level out here. But that wasn't what was happening. God was actually dealing with me, and I just didn't understand how real God was, how, how intimate he can be, how personal. He wants to be in our lives. And I was praying in that little house we lived in there in East Texas, and, and the Lord spoke to me, uh, Isaiah 54. I didn't know there was an Isaiah. I didn't know where it was in the Bible. never knew that it actually existed in the Bible. I mean, I wasn't a total uh, uh, God illiterate. I was raised kid to believe in God, but it was just kind of a, uh, a deist kind of way of being raised. We believed that there was a God. We didn't think he really was involved in our lives. He just was out there somewhere, you know. So I believed in God. I just didn't know much about it. But he gave me that scripture, and I, I looked it up, and I began to read it. And since then, I've talked about it many, many times, and I'm still figuring out what it really means to me personally, what he was trying to say to me. And preparing for this message, the Lord spoke to me about it. And it really kind of shook my world a little bit because I, you know, it's, it's like uh, Joyce Meyer. I have problems with those love messages, you know. Suzanne years ago gave me the uh, Song of Solomon and, uh, and so, so, you know, all on cassette tapes. And I thought, well, this girl's really going off the deep end. I mean, I think maybe she should have gave it to my wife. This is about how much, some, you know, I, like I'm his spouse. I'm the wife of Jesus, and I'm trying to sort all this out, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't go there. I don't, I don't understand this part of it. But I understand more, much more of it now. This is not about sex. It's not about sexual identity or gender or anything else. It is about our relationship with God. And uh, I learned much from that, by the way. Thank you very much, Suzanne, although it was quite a trial to begin with. But, amen, it worked out. But here I want to read to you just a brief thing from Isaiah 54, 4 and 5, and, and how God spoke to me in this as well. So he says, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. These are some of the things that, the words that when I read it, I'm thinking, this is personal to me, God. How am I a widow? You know, where does this play out? Well, the message I'm preaching to you today is much a revelation of this as it is anything else. And so your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the, thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. And this is where I get the idea that we are all, in some sense, Miriams. We are all to usher in the salvation of the Lord. 
And that's partly what God was trying to tell me 40-some years ago, that I would be a pastor, that I would help to bring people to Christ, that, to bring people to salvation. I didn't understand any of that at the time. I thought, you know, ministry was, you know, evangelism. You know, screaming and hollering and jumping off of platforms and, you know, running around the room and knocking people down and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, that ain't for me. I don't think I can do that, you know. Although I did a little evangelism, not quite on that level, praise the Lord. So, But nevertheless, this is God talking to me. He's talking to you in the same way. Amen. We are, we are his widow. We, we are, we're no longer widows. He, he, has become, he has become our husband, our redeemer. Our Goel, amen, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. Now, in, in Hebrew, this is interesting, it doesn't say Redeemer. It reads, the Holy One of Israel is your Goel, is actually the literal translation in the, in the Tanakh or in the Hebrew Bible. Amen. We've all become barren. We've all become unable to bear the fruit that we were created to to reproduce God, right? To reproduce the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God. Amen? Our lives were meant to become something more than what we have become. We were meant to live out our lives the way we were created to be, as Adam, as Eve, intimate with God. Relationship with God. Furthering the kingdom. Amen? But we have followed after Adam. I heard somebody say this morning, this is crazy. How many of you know, anybody ever see the Adams family? That's you. (laughs) We're Adams family. I don't know if you're it. (laughs) Thing? What? But I mean, until we get born again... I, you might just, yeah. thank you. you know, I, we're messed up, in other words. We're, we're dysfunctional. We're, we're, we're spooky, scary, weird. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we're no longer of Adam's family. Right. We've had a Galel. Yeah. We've been born into the lineage of Jesus Christ himself, yeah. into the children yeah. of God, into the family of God. Hallelujah. And God intervenes in our lives. And if we receive it, God becomes our Goel. We call it Christmas. Praise the Lord. A miracle. A birth from heaven. God is our Father. God is our Goel. Look, Luke chapter 2 and verse 7 again. And Mary's got this baby, this God. And she wraps him in swaddling clothes and sticks him in a a trough to feed the animals. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now just think about this. The God who created the universe is now a helpless baby inside the universe he created. This is so much more than a star shining in Bethlehem. The Almighty became the weakest of beings. The hands that stretched out the heavens now are too weak to even hold the hand of his own mother. The eyes that see everything, now can hardly focus. The mouth that spoke the universe into existence, now all it can offer is the cry of a helpless baby. This is awesome, man. This is unbelievable that God thought that much of humanity, of you and I, personally, that he would put himself in a position that he put himself in. It's amazing. It's the miracle of love. It's the humility of love. 
And I think more importantly than anything else is the miracle of specificity. And by that I mean God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. But in the incarnation, he becomes specific to time and to space, to only one point in space and one moment in time in order to know the power of God's love, we've got to receive it in its specificity. Religion has made it just about a generic thing, kind of like the way I talked about my childhood. Thank God my parents believed in God. They just didn't have a revelation of the whole identity and what God was trying to do. He was just God. He created us, but now you know, we're on our own. But that's why this is so important. What God is trying to show us through this is not only does does God have this specific birth, this specific place and time in, in creation and in eternity, he wants our relationship with him to be specific. Specificity is important to God. It's not just about God so loved the world, because as far as God's concerned, you were the world. You personally are that world. Each one of us is to God. As hard as that is for us to comprehend as humans, God is able to do that. He can be specific with each and every one of us in spite of how many billions of people he deals with and has dealt with. In order to know God's love, the power of that love. Now think about what I'm saying. You have to receive it in its specificity. As specifically from him, specifically to you. Not God loving everybody, God loving you. This is how people, it's like Tim said, well, he loves me? He, he must not know everything. Because if he knew everything, he couldn't love me. But this is God trying to be specific. This is God in his specificity saying, I'm dealing with you, son, and I know your problem. Girl, I know what you've been through. I know your issues. I know everything about you. But I'm specifically coming to die and to raise again for you, for you alone. Praise the Lord. Look at Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 6. When our children and our grandchildren are asking these, see, this is what we, this is how, this is what we're trying to get across to them. This isn't about grandpa's God. Right? This is about your God. This is about your Father. This is about your Jesus. This this is about the Jesus that came to be born for you. I just happened to come before you, so I got the advantage. I got the benefit sooner than you did. But it's as specific for you as it was for me, as it is for everybody. So when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we're sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Praise the Lord. His sacrifice is specifically given for you. His word. Think about this, how this plays out now. So that's, this is why I have the issue with so-and-so's healing ministry or those kind of things because it lacks specificity. It takes the specificity out of it and makes it a general thing. And God is saying, no, I've given you power to tread upon serpents. I've given you the authority to cast out demons. I've given you the ability to heal the sick because you have the healer dwelling in you specifically. And so his sacrifice is specifically for each one of us. His word is specifically for you. That's why I find Isaiah 54 something that I'm struggling with for 40 years, still trying to figure it out. It's a good thing because it forces me to go back and say, what are you talking about, Lord? What what are you saying to me? It's specific to me. I talk to you and you go, Move on, Nathan. I mean, 40 years is long enough, right? No, because it specifically was spoken to me. I can't walk away from it. I can't get loose from it. It is always there in the back of my mind saying, there's more here that I'm trying to talk to you about, Nathan. 
You know what I'm saying? And each of us have these things in our lives because he wants this word to be specific to you. Not just my word that I'm going to give it to you and tell you how you should see it and think about it and everything else. No, that's good. But what you need to do then is be like the Bereans when you've heard it. Now you need to go back and see, what are you saying to me, Lord? What are you really talking to me about? Because I know you are say, you're saying something specifically to me. Not just to a congregation, not just to a religious group, not just to a, a uh, you know, a, a, a denomination. Specifically, he's talking to you. And that's why sometimes we can get into some little conflicts because, well, he didn't say that to me, Suzanne. Well, you're not Suzanne. Praise the Lord. And Mike can say, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I, <laughs> hallelujah. I'm just saying... Yeah, sometimes we don't get it when somebody shares something that he, because he didn't say it specifically to you. But that's why also we need the body of Christ because when he speaks specifically to us, we can come together generically or, you know, as a group and get far more revelation and far more understanding of our Father. Amen? His blood and his forgiveness were poured out specifically for my specific sins. Because my sins are not your sins, probably. Some of them may be general, you know, but there are specific sins. Let's face it, we all know because we're not sharing those. Hallelujah. Amen. But we know we all have them, and they haunt us. The enemy wants to use them to haunt you. Well, yeah, but what about that? You know, I know, this was taken care of, but what about that? No, his blood was shed specifically for your sin. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, church, your love has to manifest in specificity. You can't just love this generic God. He wants it to be specific. He wants it to be personal. He wants your love for him to be specific. Now, I love the Lord. He wants you to love him specifically the way he loves you. Not your religion, not your denomination, not your belief system, not the tenets, not the dogma. Him. Even at the expense of all of that. If you never get all of the understanding and all the insight and all the revelation of the word of God, if you will love him specifically... I promise you, he'll show you more than you can ever imagine finding it in the Word through prayer or any other way. Because this is him. Can't be separated from him. Which is why there's such a, a hunger in us and a desire in us to speak the Word. What are we doing? We're loosing God. We're letting the God in us out. We're being specific about our God. Not just in general terms that, yes, I'm a believer. No. What do you believe? By his stripes, we were healed. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I know what I preached last week, and I'm not backing off of it. I'm saying we got to go through stuff by faith. You're just not going to get to wave your hand over every circumstance and situation and expect it to disappear. We can believe what the Word of God says and declare it, but sometimes we just got to walk the walk of faith. It will happen. It has to happen because it's his word. He just doesn't have to do it when I want him to do it. Praise the Lord. So your love's got to manifest in specificity. Your salvation has to manifest in specifications. In in other words, in specific actions. So you can't just lay on the couch and say, I'm saved, hallelujah, my ticket's punched, I'm good, Just, I'll die and go to heaven. That's all I got to worry about. I I, I have nothing more to worry about because I'm going to heaven. No, he's saying our salvation should be specific. It should be played out specifically. In other words, we should have an impact on other people. Amen. And I'm talking about grandchildren and and, and great-grandchildren, if that happens for you. It has for me. They're just not ready yet for for the Word of God. But I'm saying... To anybody who God puts in our path, and certainly it would be family, because we are held responsible and accountable. Now, 
what I'm saying is specific love. Specific blessings. Praise the Lord. If God t- speaks to you to bless somebody, bless them. It's, it's specificity. It's more than just saying, hey, I'm going to give a blessing. Sally's taking chickens, <laughs> not live ones, uh, to Allison and her family. They're doing better. They're, they're healing, and they, they'll, walk, they'll get on the other side of this. They're all doing better. But she's got six kids, and her husband's sick. And he's got some severe headaches and issues that are even more debilitating, you know, because everybody's symptoms are all a little bit different. They're all kind of squirrely and, and strange. So as a mother of six, and I know coming from a family of six, my mother, I don't think she ever had a day off. If she did, it didn't last long because <laughs> we knew we could find her somewhere somehow. And it was a different time, admittedly. But what I'm saying is you still got to kick cook the food. She's got little ones. You still got to change the diapers. You still got to nurse. You still got to do all the, all the stuff. Doesn't matter if you're sick. Sorry. You got to do it sick because nobody else can do it, right? So anyway, Sally's going to take some chickens down there and some stuff for lunch. So she doesn't have to fix lunch on top of everything else. Now, I only said that because we want you to think we're wonderful people. <laughs> I'm saying that because it's a specific blessing. We have, we have nine children, yeah. right? And I, can't, I, I quit counting the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but there are like 30-some grand, uh, grandkids and God knows how many of the great-grandkids. God knows. Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, we do things for all of them. We don't do the same thing for all of them. She's not taking chickens to nine families today. She's being a specific blessing to the family that needs the blessing today. Yeah. And we'll do that. And you all know what I'm talking about if you have kids. It isn't that you love one more than another. It's the one has a need right now that needs, somebody needs to meet it. And we have the, the capacity to do that. So we're going to specifically bless that child today. That's what God is talking about to us. And that's how he wants us to live our lives with the people that are around us. Not everybody needs a, a, a hug. Not everybody needs to be told, you know, I, I'm, I love you, man. I'm sorry you're going through this crap, and I'm standing with you, and I'm praying with you. But somebody does, and we need to be specific to that person and to that situation and that circumstance. Yeah. That's how we let Jesus out. That's how we birth him yeah. into circumstances and situations. And uh, I could go on forever with this, but your faith has to be specific. You have to operate in specificity when it comes to faith. Because if so-and-so gets healed, and I don't get healed in the same way, instantaneously, and it takes time, and I go through stuff, it's because God is dealing with me specifically. And he knows I can handle a little longer drawn-out thing maybe than somebody else. So he's teaching me He's specifically dealing with me within this sickness. It isn't that he's trying to get me to, to be more miserable or to, for it to last longer so long, but I'm learning something. I learned in the time that we were going through the COVID thing. I learned some things about God, and they weren't negative. They started out in my mind a little negative because I'm thinking, come on, this, let's go. Move on. Let's get out of here. Let's, let's get past this. But in the process, God was showing me, I can love you just as much in the middle of all your crap as I can by getting you out of it. You can know me specifically in the midst of your trial, in the middle of your battle, in a way that you might never know me if I just deliver you every time something comes up. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows you're going to be fine. Just calm down, bud. It's going to be all right. Same thing I have to do to my grandkids sometimes. Focus, focus. It's going to be all right. We'll get past this. Amen. You skinned your knee. Get up. Five minutes from now, you'll be beating your brother with a bat, and you won't think a thing of that. So come on. (laughs) Amen? Specificity. Hallelujah. He wants our faith. He wants our relationship with him to manifest in specificity. Specifically today. Christmas comes. If we'll live this way, 365 times a year. Praise the Lord. We're specifically focused 
on Jesus this year, this time of the year, on this day. And it's great, right? I mean, we, I love Christmas. It's, it's my favorite holiday, for sure. It's my favorite time of the year. Not the weather, but the time, the, the season, the, the ex- experiences. Hallelujah. And I can have that 365 days a year if I want to be specific about it. If I want to celebrate what Jesus has done for me every day, I can have the same experience. Amen. Isaiah 9 and 6. Praise the Lord. Thank you. For unto us a child is born. Tim did a great job with this. And by the way, aren't you glad Tim's back? Praise the Lord. I appreciate him being back. Praise God. Amen. And uh, Rita, too, by the way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, this is interesting because, again, his name shall be called, in the Hebrew, his name will be Helah. P-E-L-E-H, the wonder. So Messiah, Jesus, is the Hila, the wonder. So it's not surprising that Mary wondered. She was totally absorbed in the Hila, the wonder. So his impact on the world, it it defies natural explanation. And even after all of these ages, two millennia, he still causes the world to wonder over him. But Pilat also means the miracle. So Messiah Jesus is the Pilat, the miracle of the world. His birth was a miracle. His ministry was a miracle. His resurrection, a miracle. Every moment of his life on earth was a miracle. And the word hila also means too high, T-O-O, too. Too high, too hard, too great. Too much. So what's that tell us about our salvation? It's above us. Beyond our ability to do it. It's exactly what Don was talking about with their grandchildren. We all have those conversations. Trying to get them to understand it isn't how, how good you can be. We want you to be good because we're decent people. But that isn't what this is about. You're going to not be good all the time. How do I know? I know your progeny. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I know where you came from. Hallelujah. I just know you're a human. Yeah. Right? It's above us. It's beyond our ability to do. We can't do it. But he can. Because he's the Pila. Amen. He can do what's too hard for us. He can do what's impossible for us. He is the gift of Christmas. And if Pilate is in you, then he's given you the gift of power, the gift of authority, the gift of dominion to do what's too hard for you. (laughs) To do what's too much for you to do. Isn't this faith? Isn't this what we're talking about? We struggle with it, but it's partly about the specificity of this and knowing that it's something he gave me, not something I've earned. So even when I screw up, I still have it. I still have the potential, the ability to do it if I will just take the step of faith. 
and not let the, the consequences or the, even the results dictate whether I believe it or not. If Mary had taken that route, we'd still be looking for a Savior. Or God would have had to find somebody else. It's to attain what's too high for you to attain. To live a life that's too great for you to live. I mean, how many of you think, when you think about the, the, the things God says about us in here, and then we think about us living that life, we think, oh man, he, he must have been talking about my brother. You know? No. He's specifically talking to you. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3.19. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Praise the Lord. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. Born of God. It doesn't get much more specific. You can do DNA testing and find out if you are really the daddy, if I'm your daddy. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, God says you don't have to bother with the test. I'm giving you the information here straight up. Specifically, you have become my child, my son, and my daughter. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And if that's the case, if he dwells in you, then you have the power yes. of the pillar. Yes. Right? Because that's what's in you. That's what's dwelling in you. Amen? The wonder. Praise the Lord. It's just like with Mary. He has to be the one who always causes you to wonder. To wonder, wow, man, oh man, how in the world and why and, you know, why would he take me and why would he do this and why would he make this available? It's the wonder of it all. That's the, what he, that's what Mary's showing us from the very initial stages of this. It's the wonder. We hid in our heart. We ponder it. And it's wonderful. It's too wonderful to describe. He has to be the one that always causes you to wonder. To wonder over his grace. To wonder over his mercy. To wonder over God's love for you. To wonder over the fact you're saved. When you look around and see other people probably as good as we are, but lost and headed for a devil's hell and living a life of confusion and hatred and bitterness and fear every day on this planet. Never stop knowing him as the wonder of your life. That's the problem that sometimes happens with Christianity and with religion. It becomes generic and we lose the wonder And it just becomes rituals and to-dos. We can't lose the wonder of who he is in our lives. He's the light of the world. Think of all the Christmas lights. I had to take my snowman down because of the windstorm that was coming. It's a pain. (laughs) It's a pain. But unlike Sally, I I can't leave it up year-round. It just bothers me in July when I'm mowing and yeah. you got to move frosty, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. But he's the light. He's the reason for the lights on the trees. He's the reason, whether people understand this or not, the reason for the lights on the buildings, the reason for the, 
for the decorations. And, of course, people think, well, it's just I want to lighten the house. No, you, you don't know, but you're recognizing the light of the world. You're recognizing the light that brought the beauty of God back to this planet. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Look at, uh, this will be the last scriptures, uh, John chapter 12, 35 through 46. John 12, 35 through 46. Hallelujah. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed him not that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me, should not abide in darkness. It's the wonder of him. All the lights, all the celebrations, all the gifts, all the, uh, all the love that is expressed, that isn't expressed the other 364 days out of the year is literally a part of his birth, the birth of love, the God of love into this earth and specifically into us as believers. Many can celebrate the exchanging of gifts and the, and the stress of shopping and all the other stuff. But few be there that really enjoy the time as a celebration of life, of what God has done for us specifically and through us to our children. I was praying this morning and I thought, God, your mercy is so unbelievable. When I think, and the devil, believe me, he reminds me. If I don't think about it during the daytime, he'll remind me when I go to bed. And I've had some weird dreams here recently, and I think it's just because God has been trying to speak to me, and I've been getting a lot of negative junk. But I think just what I just turned it back into a praise to the Lord. And when I got up early, I'm just saying, Lord, I'm so thankful for your mercy and for your grace. So grateful for my family that you through me, with all of my flaws, with all of my screw-ups, saw fit to bring these other young lives into this world who now know you, who now believe in you. Flawed, yes. Imperfect, yes. But far, far further down the road in terms of their relationship with God than I was at their age, knowing that God has something, something specific planned for their life. Because they are specific to him because I want him to be specific to me. I want him to know. With all of my issues, I got stuff, you know, you know we all have in how we relate to people and how we express ourselves. And, and I'm, you know, I grew up in a family where it wasn't huggy, touchy, lovey, dovey, all that kind of stuff. We knew we were loved, but we expressed that love through hard work, <laughs> hallelujah, by doing what you were told. And, and I mean, we didn't, we just didn't, Talk love, you know what I'm saying? And so I've made it a point to hug and to talk more of those kind of things to my grandkids than ever got spoken to me. Not that my grandparents didn't love me. They just were not those kind of people. They weren't raised that way. That wasn't what they were capable of. But I've made it an effort to, to be sappy love, you know what I mean? To, to make a point that Popo loves you, you know, I'm going to just hug you and all that kind of stuff, even with my own kids. So this is, this is our way of saying God's love is specific for you, too, as it is for me. Amen?
all of these celebrations, all of these lights, all of this, it can't come close to the wonder of God, to the wonder of what Jesus has done. So I'm just closing with this. Never stop wondering over the wonder of your salvation. Never get to the place where it's just, well, I'm saved. Never get to the place where you get past the wonder of him. If it doesn't cause you to wonder, then it's not the pillah that you're experiencing. Let him be that pilah, the wonder, the too much, the wonder of your life. And if you do, God has promised your life will be full of wonders, continuous birthings of wonder, Christmas every day. Merry Christmas. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Christmas. Enjoy your families. Enjoy the specificity of your God. Experience His love and share yours with Him. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week.